Amen. If you have a Bible, I invite you to take it and turn, if you will, to the third chapter of Mark's Gospel. Mark 3 is where we've been and where we'll continue this day. And as you're turning there, I'd actually like to also invite you to join me in, in just a moment to pray for one of our own. Yesterday afternoon, which is per my typical habit, Saturday afternoon I was in my home office preparing to uh, sketch out the trajectory of this sermon. I'll spend all week meditating on it, studying it. Saturday, typically, I, I put it together about 3 o'clock, and I was not 15 minutes into my study when I received word that one of our own was in crisis. One of our newest members, in fact, he's not even a member yet, today he was going to join at dinner with the pastor, Timothy Maxwell, who most of us have a connection with because he is our student pastor, Blake Maxwell's father. Tim Maxwell, who's been attending our church now for the last several months, was taken to the hospital by ambulance having had a heart attack where he's been in critical condition. Tim's a young man, uh, as you can imagine. I know many of you probably haven't had the chance to meet him, but if you know anything about Blake, uh, you know Tim. Blake comes by it honestly. Tim is a kind, gentle, godly man and is in need this hour of our prayer. And I'm happy to report that there have been encouraging signs. In fact, I received a message shortly before the service with something that's praiseworthy, so we can rejoice in that. But I ask you, as Blake's church, as soon-to-be Tim's church, to pray on behalf of our brother this Lord's Day. And to the family that I, I trust is watching, on behalf of all of Hickory Grove, we do love you, Maxwells. And to Jan, Tim's wife, we especially are praying for you this hour, for Blake, Holly, their six beautiful children. This church loves you, and we are praying for you today. Before we pray, let's read this word. Why don't you stand with me if you found Mark 3. And just a, a word of context. Jesus has been making the rounds. He has made a name for himself. Everybody is enamored with this guy. Uh, well, to be clear, many are. Many have seen his miraculous works, and they can't help but cry, Lord. But if you recall, even just this past week, the closest to him, his very family, just read in verses 20 and 21, they didn't conclude evidently, Lord. They thought, lunatic. They thought he was insane. But like C.S. Lewis's famed trilemma, when you deal with Jesus, you either got to conclude he's Lord, he's lunatic, or most perversely, which we'll find in our text today, you'll conclude he's a liar. And we're going to find this accusation in Mark 3, beginning in verse 22. Let me read down through verse 30. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. And so Jesus called them to him, and he said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? You see, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom can't stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house isn't going to be able to stand. So if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he can't stand, but, but he's coming to an end. You see, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then, indeed, he may plunder his house. So truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. Would you join me as we pray? Father in heaven, I'm asking that you would come and use me in spite of me to comfort the otherwise convicted in this room. Oh, I don't want to lay a heavy burden. I want them to feel 
the freeing, wonderful grip of your grace on them. But conversely, Lord, I trust that there are some in this room who are comfortable and need to be convicted. And so by the power of your spirit, come and do just that, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't you love verse 28? Did you read it? If not, turn to it with me again. Underscore it, highlight it, inscribe it on the tablet of your heart. Truly, amen, he says. Truly, with great fervency, he declares, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven. Praise God for that. Is that not the sum of the faith? Are we not a people that glory in God's grace? Is that not why we sing every Lord's Day? Because ours is a God of grace. We can approach this throne of grace with confidence. All sins will be forgiven. This ought not surprise us. Verse 28, we dare be tempted to presume upon the riches of this kindness because we know that we know that we know that ours is a loving God, that He is a good God who is good to the children of man. He is a gracious God whose grace is plentiful. Oh, ours is a merciful God whose mercies are manifold. Paul tells us he is rich in mercy. This shouldn't surprise us because ours is a compassionate God who extends his loving uh, compassion to his children. Ours is a forgiving God who has forgiven us so far as the east is from the west. Indeed, That's why we call Him Savior. He has saved His people from His sins. He is our refuge and our strength, a very present help, the Scripture says in times of trouble. Folks, is this not the Gospel truth? Ours is a God of grace, and so we hold up the banner of verse 28 and say, all sins will be forgiven the children of men. Amen. Praise God. Except what do you do? With verse 29, does it not stun you, startle you, stagger you? What do you do with what appears to be an odd caveat? Dare I say a limit to God's grace? For just after reaching the height of God's grace, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men. Verse 29, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin? What do we make of this unforgivable, unpardonable, eternal sin? Surely it's not what some of you may be privately wondering. Is it my sexual sin that nobody knows of? And if that's you, I must say that King David, amongst others, would rightly object. For God's grace is greater than all of our sin, including those most heinous of sexual sins. It can't be the sin of idolatry, for the people of Israel would in one accord object and say, our God has been gracious to us despite decades, if not centuries, of unfaithfulness. It can't be the sin of extortion. Just take the Gospel writer Matthew. A man who, by very virtue of his job, was financially extorting the people of God, and he claimed the grace of our good God. It can't be the sin of homicide. Moses would object, having killed a man himself. It couldn't be the sin of adultery, for Rahab would surely object. It can't be the sin even of blasphemy, for the text says explicitly in verse 28, All manners of blasphemy will be forgiven. So what do we make then of this unforgivable, unpardonable, more specifically eternal sin described as the blasphemy against the Spirit? Well, like all interpretation, context is key. It matters. Today I want to 
bring you in close, and then take you out far so that we can make sense of what is going on here. What is the warning Jesus has for us? And I want to state it generally up front, and I'm going to state it almost arguably too generally, and I'm going to spend the rest of my time refining, specifying what I mean. So if you're taking notes, mark this down. I want you to see that the only sin God won't forgive is unrepentant sin. Now that ought not strike you as controversial. Because on the one hand, we readily believe this, do we not? After all, we're not universalists. We believe that there is a gospel call to repent. And that if you willfully do not repent, you are in liable for judgment. In other words, not only does the gospel command this, demand this, we recognize that, well, the cross demands this. Why else would Jesus die? If it's true that there is no eternal judgment, that God just saves anybody and everybody from start to finish in the end, then what was the purpose of the cross? The gospel demands it. The cross demands it. Indeed, eternity itself demands it. Why else would there be that great dichotomy, that great distinction, that great tension between heaven and hell? We ought to recognize that, yes, it's true. The only sin God won't forgive is unrepentant sin. But I think there's more at play here. The text demands that we not just stop short at, okay, well, God won't forgive sin that is unrepented of at death. There is something more here. So I want to invite you to just come in with me, look to the text, and notice with me, if you will, five clues, for lack of a better word. I, I notice five, you know, clues, or you could maybe just describe them as warnings, species of unrepentant sin. And as we notice these through the text, I, I, I want to pray that two things happen. You, you heard me allude to this in my prayer earlier. Uh, on the one hand, I, I'm asking the Lord to come in this room and to comfort those of you who are going to feel so convicted by this text that you're going to start morbidly introspecting yourself, wondering, have I done this? Am I outside the forgiveness of God? If that's you, I'm asking the Lord to use me to comfort you this hour. But conversely, I want to ask the Lord to convict those of you who are otherwise comfortable, who are indifferent to the word that's about to be proclaimed. For I notice with me five warnings, five species, five clues of this type of unrepentant sin that the Lord so strikingly declares to be an eternal sin. If you're taking notes, mark this first one down. I want you to see that the only sin God won't forgive is unrepentant sin that's deliberate. For notice, if you will, who is involved in verse 22. All the people have either seen Jesus as Lord or some of His family have seen Him as a lunatic, but there is a unique crowd of people that sees Jesus as a liar. These are the scribes. And before we go any farther, I, I think it demands that we step back and recognize who these people are. Don't pass over too quickly the fact that it is the scribes of all people who declare Jesus to be a liar. The scribes, the most privileged people in the New Testament. The people that had access to the Word unlike anybody else in their day. They knew better than anybody the law and the prophets and by conclusion, by deduction, all the great promises of God. They had surely transcribed with their very hand all the wonderful promises of the Savior to come in Isaiah amongst other places. They knew the Word. And not only did they know literally the Word, they knew the Word who became flesh. For they saw Jesus, the Word of the living God, before their very eyes. They had first hand evidence of Jesus' miracle working power. They saw it, and yet, nevertheless, despite seeing with their own two eyes, they deliberately 
accused him of a falsehood. This sin that we're about to unpack in a moment, the first layer of it is we must admit that it is a deliberate sin. In other words, it's a sin from somebody who knows better. This isn't a mistaken wrong turn, like you might take the wrong exit on 485. This is something that's that's more deliberate. This is akin to the sin we see the writer of Hebrews describe in chapter 10 and verse 26 when he says, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the gift of the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains for us a sacrifice for sin. This is a deliberate, concerted sin. And I just want to drive this home for for some of you in this room who are privately thinking, if only I had more evidence, I would believe. If only I could put my fingers in his wounds. If only I could see. I, I can't blindly do this. And my word to you is, beware. If you could see, in all likelihood, you wouldn't believe. For the scribes themselves saw with their own two eyes. Don't think that belief will come later when you have more evidence. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. The first sliver, the first layer of this sin God won't forgive is it is an unrepentant sin that is deliberate. But I want you to see, secondly, it's also one that, for lack of a better word, is determined. For You probably missed this. In the English, you don't catch it. But if you were reading the original language, what's interesting is in verse 22, it says the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were, here's what it literally says, continuously saying. That word in the original tense means it's continuously happening. This is something they have been habitually talking about. In other words, the accusation that these scribes are bringing to Jesus was not a low point. This wasn't a careless, momentary slip of the tongue. How many of us in this room have had those? This was a habitual disposition of the heart. This is really what we see the Bible repeatedly describe as evidence of an ever-hardening heart. Paul uses a graphic Uh, description to describe this hardened heart. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 2, he describes it as a seared conscience. This is somebody who knows better and has resolved nonetheless to continuously, habitually, with great determination, keep loving what God hates and hating what God loves. And so before I go any further, there are some in this room that I think need to hear the second warning of the text. If you have resolved in your heart to delay, if you believe that there will come a day when you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you will one day come and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, but not today. You don't want to change today because there's always tomorrow Let the prayer request I began our sermon with and let the hard reality of life grip each of us this hour. Don't delay. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. For life is a vapor. Not only are you not promised tomorrow, my friends, if God gives you tomorrow, it is not certain you would even will that it be. It is not guaranteed that you would even desire to turn. So if you feel the call of God this hour, today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart for the only sin God won't forgive is unrepentant sin. This is a sin that is deliberate. It's a sin that is determined, a habitual sin. But thirdly, there's another layer. We need to keep unfolding this together. Another layer to this sin is it's a deceitful kind of sin. This is a sin that makes stuff up. That looks at 2 plus 2 and says it does not equal 4. 
This is a deeply perverse type of sin. For notice what the scribes accused Jesus of in the latter half of verse 22. They said, He is possessed by Beelzebul. Y'all know who Beelzebul is? Now there's debate. This name has some layers to it. On the one hand, it's as old as the people of Canaan, the Philistines in particular. They had a town named Ekron, and in this town they had a god named Beelzebul. Literally, it meant god of the high place, or maybe of the house or the temple. But evidently, the people of Israel, seeking to mock uh, this god, ended up renaming him this name Beelzebub, which means Lord of the flies, or Lord, more graphically, of the dung heap. For they noticed that when there was, forgive me, excrement, often associated with this carrion, associated with dead, decaying bodies, were flies. And what happens when flies uh, hover around something that's dead, dying, or decaying? Eventually, you're going to see something alive come out of what was once dead. Forgive me. Maggots. Happy Lord's Day, everybody. (laughs) And the image was graphic, for Israel was in essence saying, your God is the God that brings life out of something that's dead, disgusting, decaying. And the scribes, the most privileged people of God who knew the Word and the Word itself came and looked at our infinitely holy Lord and said, Beelzebul, Lord of the flies. You are possessed by Satan himself. This became an ugly pejorative term for the arch enemy of all, Satan himself. You are possessed by Satan and all these miracles you have performed have been performed by the power of Satan himself. Just consider what's happening in this moment. Do you think the scribes believe this? Really? They're not idiots. They were making this up. What happens typically when you can't win an argument? You tend to attack the person. It's called an ad hominem attack. When you don't have the arguments in your favor, as Socrates famously said, when the debate is lost, slander is the tool of the loser. There was an infamous Nazi, Joseph Goebbels, who famously remarked, if you tell a lie, If you just tell a lie enough, people are going to begin to believe it. And this is what the scribes began to do. They just went straight to the man and realized, we can't deny the fact that this guy has raised people from the dead. What do you do with that? I can't can't make something up there, so I'm going to have to attack who he is at the core. I'm going to just lie in this moment. This is why the prophet Isaiah said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. This is why Paul graphically described the essence of sin as exchanging the truth for a lie. My friends, need you be reminded that Satan is a liar? He's a liar. Be not ignorant of his designs. Why is the church so critical? Why is this gathering such a medicine for our souls? One of the many reasons is because God has designed this gathering for us to become all the more aware of Satan's designs. Hebrews 3 and verse 13 reminds us to exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of us might be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And my friends, if recent days have illustrated anything for us in this country, it is that it can be easy no matter what your political persuasion is to fall victim to falsehood, to lies, Beware, this sin is a deliberate, determined, perversely deceitful species of sin. And so Jesus responds. And we come beginning in verse 23 to His retort. And His retort 
is wonderful. And it highlights for us a fourth layer to this unforgivable so-called sin. For lack of a better word, let me describe it as a defiant, unrepentant sin. For notice what Jesus says in response to these scribes. Verse 23, he calls them to himself. And he says to them in parables or these little mini illustrations. Are you all out of your mind? How could Satan cast out Satan? He wouldn't do that. He gives us some word pictures. He begins with the picture of a kingdom. And he says, well, come on. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom's not going to stand. Jesus is talking to a bunch of people who remember their history. That their nation, the great mighty united kingdom of Israel that reigned in prosperity under King Saul and King David and King Solomon. Do you all recall what happened after Solomon? It splits in two between Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And what was once a mighty united kingdom is divided and soon fell apart. 722, the northern kingdom falls. 685, 686, the 586 rather, the southern kingdom falls. The thing falls apart and Jesus says, you know this, a, house div- a kingdom divided against itself, it's never going to stand. And he brings it closer to home and gives us a second illustration and says, well, come on, this, you know Satan would not be in cahoots against himself. A house divided against itself will never stand. How many parents in this room know that to be true? You want to know what's a recipe for trouble in the home? Not taking your wife's side. (laughs) Do you want to know what's a recipe for trouble in the home? Dad telling you no and going behind dad's back to mom. A house divided against itself will not stand. Our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, brought these words into the American consciousness in a famed speech in 1858 when he was running for Senate. He once remarked about the union that was on the verge of splitting right on the uh, precipice of the Civil War. And he famously quoted this verse in this speech when he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And so Jesus brings the logic home. And he says, so come on, guys. If Satan has risen up against himself, verse 26, and he's divided, he's not going to stand. He's coming to an end. You really think Satan is using me to drive out demons, to end his kingdom? That's absurd. Remember, in verse 27, nobody can enter a strong man's house, Satan being the strong man. Nobody can enter his house. Nobody can plunder his goods. That means In other words, take all the people and free them who are demon-possessed. Nobody's going to be able to do this unless he first binds the strong man. So you're telling me that I bound Satan so that I could make Satan's kingdom grow. Makes no sense. And my friends, do you want to know who was amening in their heart in that moment? The scribes. Because they knew they were deluded. They knew their accusation was hollow and empty. They knew that this was a joke. But nevertheless, they were defiant. They were bold in their opposition. They resolved in the face of absurdity with this accusation. And my friends, we need to remember that yes, Satan is defeated. We don't have to wonder whether or not Satan is going to win or lose against our Lord. He is defeated, but my friends, he is defiant as he goes down. And evidently, it runs in the family. For the children of the evil one, the children of the night, the children of Satan, those who with a recalcitrant heart, those who obstinately refuse to repent of their sins, in likewise are defiant in the face of the facts. This is the type of sin that we see John illustrate in verse three, chapter 3 and verse 19 when he says people loved the darkness rather than the light. This is what Paul describes when he says the essence of sin is suppressing the truth. You know it to be true and you hate it. So you push it down. And I don't want to use the illustrations because it's a mixed audience this morning. But do I need to? Just turn on the television, go to your local library, open Twitter. You're going to see this. Go now to your local athletic event, and you are going to see a rank 
distortion of the truth that defies logic. It makes no sense. It's absurd. My friends, here's a word. It is outwardly, boldly defiant. My friends, the only sin God won't forgive is an unrepentant sin that is deliberate, determined, deceitful, defiant. But I dare not conclude the sermon without one fifth and final point, which I think is going to bring this all home and open our eyes to the precise nature of this so-called eternal sin. For fifthly and finally, I see in verses 28 and 30 that this is, for lack of a better word, a decisive sin. For notice in verse 29 the precise language he uses to describe this eternal sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy, a sin of the mouth. But remember, out of the mouth proceeds what was in the heart, as Jesus told us. So this wasn't just loose lips. This was a heart proceeding out the lips. And blasphemy against the Spirit is evidently unforgivable, which should give all of us pause. Because all of us in this room at one time or another have blasphemed the Lord. Our lips have been loose. We have been callous. We have been too casual with our language. Whether it be using His name in vain or speaking something in our heart that dishonors Him. Who amongst us does not fall under the conviction of blasphemy? And what do you make with verse 28 when it says, All manners of blasphemy that are uttered will be forgiven the children of men. So what do we do then with this unique category of sin called blasphemy against the Spirit? Let me say from the outset before I unpack this that it is contested, debated, it is admittedly difficult. Complicating matters further is the parallel account of this story we find recorded in Matthew 12. Matthew actually even adds another layer to Jesus' words and describes not merely blasphemy against the Spirit, but compares it negatively to blaspheming the Father and Son. In other words, he says there's a whole new level of evil involved when you blaspheme the Spirit. Why? What is going on here? I think I'm on good ground when I, when I make this conclusion. There is a wealth of scholars who would conclude with me that what is likely being described here is a sin in which you have grown so deliberate, so determined, so deceitful, so defiant in your obstinate unrepentance that you now look at the one hope you have, the Holy Spirit of God, who alone can convict you of sin. Do you realize that? Do you realize that you were not saved because you were smart wise, just made a good decision one day, that there's going to come a day where you're going to stand before God and in that moment you are going to credit the Holy Spirit of God for opening your eyes, for convicting you of your sin, for enabling your faith. You will credit your faith to the work of the Spirit of God. Praise God it is by the Spirit that we are convicted of sin and righteousness. And it is this species of sin that looks at the only hope you have, the Spirit of God, and spurns it itself and says, I want no interest in you. I have no interest in you. I don't want it. I am so hardened in my heart that I have decisively looked at the only hope I have, the Spirit of God, and I blaspheme it. I blaspheme you. I am unrepentant of my unrepentance. I am quite settled with where I am. I resist fully, finally, conclusively the Spirit of God. My friends, I don't quite know what to do with this. But this is not the only place in the Bible we see this so-called eternal sin. So we need to reckon with it. I believe that this sin is echoed by the Apostle John in 1 John 5 and verse 16 when he says, If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, just ask God. God will give him life. 
but to those who commit sins that do lead to death, I say you don't even need to pray for that. What do you do with that? What do you do with the sins that the writer of Hebrews describes time and again as a deliberate sin that is beyond the pale of repentance? My friends, evidently there is a species of sin that can take root in the hearts of those who have hardened themselves against the Lord that can put you, I dare say, beyond repentance insofar as you have resolved in your mind and heart to spurn the Spirit Himself. Now before I go any further, let me say this critical word to you. If this moment you are deeply disturbed by that and you're wondering, is it me? Oh, I'm convicted by this. May I just say to you, if you care, it's not you. That is proof positive you have not committed this sin. If you are bothered in any way, shape, or form by what I have proclaimed today, it is probably a sweet sign from the Spirit of God that the Spirit is within you. He has indwelt you. He is convicting you this hour. And you are not beyond for repentance. You are indeed being called this hour by the Spirit of God. But if you don't care, beware. If in smugness and with an odd settledness, you mock what I say, you hear my words, and you are utterly and completely indifferent to the words of my mouth, I plead with you, beware this hour, for there is a sin that leads unto death. There is a sin that will settle in your soul such that you will come to the point where you have been so deliberate, so determined, so deceitful, so defiant that it will prove decisive in your mind and heart. You will spurn, as it were, the very Spirit of God. And so let me conclude this hour with a most critical word to all of us today. I want to echo what I just stated that if indeed you are convicted this moment, may I give words of comfort to you. Perhaps you're wondering, I feel convicted, but Kyler, you don't know what I've done, and I'm wondering if it's me. Kyler, you don't know how sexually immoral I've been. You don't know what I've done. You don't know the idolatry that is in my heart time and again. Kyler, you don't know the greed that chokes me the things that I've stolen. You don't know what I did last night, what I saw last night. You don't know what I've done. And if that you take heart, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 9 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous won't inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Yes, sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you. You have been washed. You have been cleansed. You have been justified by the person and work of Jesus. My friends, our banner is verse 28. All sins will be forgiven the children of man, including every dark species of sin in your heart. Take comfort then. If the Spirit is convicting you this hour, turn from that sin. Repent of that sin. But beware as I pray that there is a sin God won't forgive. It is unrepentant sin. And the Scripture suggests that there is a odd, determined, deviant, defiant, deceitful, deliberate sin that if you don't repent of it may indeed prove decisive in your heart and soul. And so would you hear me this hour? You are here this moment to hear this word. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Would you join me as we pray? And with your heads bowed, for you who are convicted by the Spirit of God, 
rejoice in that grace within and plead that God would bring you to a place where you would flee deliberate sin. Flee patterns of habitual determined sin. Spurn deceit, lies, twistings of the truth. You would not boldly continue in the sin in a defiant way, disregarding plain logic. And that by God's grace, your sin would not prove decisive in your life. Oh, I pray that would be true of me and of you. And for you who have been pierced by the word this hour, oh, if you hear my voice today, do not harden your heart. Father in heaven, by the power of your spirit and to the glory of Jesus, do this. Pierce your people with your word. I pray that they would see that your grace is plentiful. Oh, indeed, we can at the same time declare that there is a sin you won't forgive and it is unrepentant sin and in the same breath with full assurance of faith proclaim in one voice that your grace is indeed greater than all of our sin if we confess with our mouths that you are lord and believe in our hearts that you have been raised from the dead we shall be saved and so call your people this moment this hour to turn from their sins to believe and receive life eternal And I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.